Okay, hello. I'm Doug Arnold from the University of Minnesota, and I have the distinct honor to chair the first lecture of the seminar in the analysis and methods of partial differential equations, or PDE for short. This new seminar series is an initiative of the SIAM Journal on Mathematical Analysis and the SIAM Activity Group on the Analysis of PDE. It will meet the first Thursday of each month, henceforth, except skipping in August and January. And it will bring outstanding speakers presenting colloquium level survey talks, and perhaps later also some more focused seminars. Although the series was initiated as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, it will continue independently of the course of the pandemic. The seminar begins today with a wonderful exemplar of the type of speaker and type of talk we have to look forward to. The speaker is Sir John Ball. He's emeritus status at Oxford University, where until recently he'd been the Sedleyan Professor of Natural Philosophy and the director of the Oxford Center for Nonlinear PDE. Sir John's accomplishments in both research and scientific leadership are absolutely extraordinary. His main research areas lie in the calculus of variations, nonlinear partial differential equations, infinite dimensional dynamical systems, and their applications in nonlinear mechanics. Besides being recognized by a knighthood in 2006, his work has been honored by SIAM with the Theodore von Karman Prize in 1999, and he received the King Faisal International Prize in Mathematics in 2018. He's also a fellow of the Royal Society and of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Among his many leadership positions, he served on both the Abel Prize Committee and the Fields Medal Committee, and as president of the London Mathematical Society and of the International Mathematical Union, and on the executive board of the International Council for Science. He's probably best known for his work bringing calculus of variations and nonlinear PDE to bear on elasticity and on microstructure and materials. In recent years, much of his work has been directed towards mathematical study of liquid crystals. Today, he'll speak to us on some energy minimization problems for liquid crystals. There'll be questions, a chance to ask questions at the end, but now I turn it over to Sir John Ball. Well, thank you very much, Doug, for that kind introduction. And thanks to the, to the committee for inviting me. And, uh, Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, wherever you may be. So I, I'm going to give a, a kind of survey talk on uh, liquid crystals, so I won't assume that you know anything about liquid crystals, and I, and I know that there are some experts in the audience, and I hope they won't be uh, too disappointed. So um, although liquid crystals are a very special kind of material, they're a their study is a kind of melting pot for different branches of science, physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, and certainly mathematics, and lots of different branches of mathematics, PDE, calculus variations, lots of computational problems, and quite a bit of topology. And, it, and it's getting uh, more popular. Here's the number of um, papers mentioning uh, liquid crystals in mass Now, Of course, one shouldn't study things just because they're popular, but it does sort of indicate that there are some interesting problems to some people nowadays anyway. Well, the, the, the technological importance of liquid crystals for displays and on TVs and your watches uh, results from their interaction with applied fields. However, I'm, I'm going to suppose in this talk that those fields are absent, which of course is a bad thing to do, but it doesn't affect the analysis much because they, they sort of add lower order terms. So the, the essential analytic difficulties are present without the fields. Now they come in uh, several different types in, in increasing order of mathematical difficulty. They're pneumatics, cholesterics, and smectics. And I'm going to stick today to pneumatics. And many liquid crystals consist of rod-like molecules. Here's a, here's a picture or here's a space-filling models, uh, courtesy of Claudio Zanoni, of two um, typical liquid crystal molecules, MBBA and 5CB. And you see the, the color code for the elements and the molecules. They're about two nanometers long, and they're, they're roughly rod-like molecules, not perfect, and they're not, they're not exactly the same if you, if you turn them over. Often 
are approximated by ellipsoids in pictures, and, that, and, and that's, what, that's what I will do. So uh, the, the pneumatic phase comes from a, a phase transformation from a higher temperature isotropic phase. So um, above some uh, critical temperature, beta critical, the, the, the liquid crystal is, a, is an isotropic fluid. So the, the, the molecules, their centers of masses and their orientations are randomly distributed. There's no order of any kind. But then when you reduce the uh, temperature below theta critical, uh, the, 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 the thermal agitation gets overcome by the, by the interaction between the molecules themselves. And so they form, in this case, uh, a pneumatic phase where locally the molecules like to line up more or less in, in, in one direction. Here it's sort of vertical. Now, if you, if you uh, reduce the temperature still more, then, then something else may happen. You, sorry, it, it might form another liquid crystal phase. So here I've drawn a, a schematic representation of a smectic phase in which the, um, the molecules line up in, in layers approximately one a molecule thick, or it might crystallize into a into a into a solid uh, crystal. And the uh, the temperatures for MBBA, which was one of those uh, molecules that I showed you, are uh, forty five and seventeen degrees C. Well, in order to 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 represent the 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 order, uh, there are different choices possible of order parameters, and so. I'm going to start with the, the probability density function, which is uh, I'll sort of, in terms of terminology, call the Onsaga uh, description. So let's fix a time t and, and look at our liquid crystal, which occupies this region omega. And here's a point of the liquid crystal. But we do some kind of coarse graining. We take a very small ball here blown up, center x with radius delta, small enough to be considered to be a point, if you like, but large enough uh, to contain many molecules. So to give you an idea of the numbers, if delta was one micron, then that ball would contain about a billion molecules. So easily enough to have a, a good kind of statistical description. Now, the, or the orientation of each molecule will represent by uh, uh, p tensor p. So p is, is the, um, the orientation of, of one of the molecules, and, and we'll consider p and minus p to be equivalent. And so this, this p tensor p is a matrix. You can think of it as, 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 as defining the lines through the origin parallel to p, which form the real projective plane rp2. But it's just a matrix, uh, and uh, from that matrix you can recover p but only up to a sign. So P itself belongs to the to S2, the sphere, but P tensor P is, is an RP2. So what we do is we, we pick molecules at random from this ball here, and we look and see what their orientations are. And that way, we get a very good approximation to a, a continuous probability distribution on the sphere. So P is on, on the sphere S2, and uh, because of this statistical head-to-tail head symmetry, we suppose that rho is, um, is invariant to changing p to minus p. So of course it's non-negative and it integrates up to one because it's a probability distribution. And we don't consider singular probability distributions here because they would correspond to perfect ordering, uh, which, which never actually happens. Now you could also average over a small space-time ball. That's probably a good thing to do because these molecules are all jiggling around, but I, 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 will, I will work at a fixed time. Okay. Now you might think that, that well, rho is, of course, an infinite dimensional order parameter, so you might want to have a, a finite dimensional order parameter, and so you could consider using moments of rho. And uh, the, 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 the landau degen theory uses the second moment of rho. Why the second moment? Well, the first moment uh, doesn't give you any information because of the symmetry condition of rho. The first moment is automatically zero. The second moment is defined uh, to be m of x, which you get by integrating against rho p tensor p. And you can see just from the form that it's a, it's a symmetric matrix. It's also a positive definite matrix because if you 
If you work out m e dot e, you see you get the integral of p dot e squared, which is certainly non-negative, and it could only be, um, and it can't be zero unless rho was supported on the great circle perpendicular to e, which it can't be if it's a continuous uh, probability distribution. So it's a strictly positive symmetric matrix, and its trace, well, you can take the trace inside, and the trace of p tends to be is one, and the integral of rho is one, so the trace is, is one. Well, operationally, how can you calculate m of x? Well, for example, in a, if you were doing a molecular dynamic simulation, how would you calculate it? Well, suppose that the ith molecule occupies the bounded domain omega i, little omega i. And I'll suppose that all the little omega i's are, are disjoint because the molecules don't overlap and they're congruent and they have volume v. And the ith molecule, let's suppose it has orientation pi tensor pi. So now, now denote by um, uh, pi i the characteristic function of the molecule omega i, and let m of little m of x be the sum of the characteristic functions, each with uh, pi tensor pi. So you can imagine all these molecules, on a, and on each molecule you have its, its orientation. Now the volume fraction at the point x, that's the, the, the total volume of the molecules in x divided by the volume of, of uh, bx delta, and we'll call that c of x. Then a, then a short calculation uh, tells you that, that m of x, well, here's the definition again of m of x, is very well represented by the average of m divided by the, the volume fraction. So that's how you could kind of calculate it in a, in a, in a, in a simulation. I want you to make a kind of curious remark about this, which is that, um, in fact, this expression, which is a good substitute for the for m of x, is in fact an h2 function of x. Now, I have no idea whether this is useful in liquid crystals, but it's certainly a, an interesting curiosity. And it's because of this lemma, which I, I learned about a couple of months ago, that if you have a, a u, which is an L2 of Rn, and you look at the average over a ball as a function of x, then it's in h n plus one over two of r n. So here we've got the case n equals three. So it's in it's in h two. If we if we'd average over a space time ball, then we, n would be four, and then it would have been h five over two. Now um, there are many uh, lemmas like this in the in the results like this in the literature, the harmonic analysis literature. But I, I've never actually seen this explicitly stated, though it's very like um, many things that, that that I have seen. So if, if any of you know um, an explicit reference for this, I, I'd be very interested to uh, to get it. Now I came across this because I was teaching a course on the on hyperbolic equations, and for the first time in my life, I I, I talked about the linear wave equation in a course and, and in particular Kirchhoff's solution and I had a lot of trouble recognizing reconciling Kirchhoff's solution to the wave equation with with the usual sort of energy finite energy solutions and, and so this this lemma actually um, well sorted out uh, reconciled things as far as I was concerned anyway very good anyway that's just a kind of curiosity so another kind of uh, order parameter you, you might use is the director, and this is what's used in the Oze and Frank theory. So it's the, it's the sort of the mean orientation of molecules. So here it's this, uh, this vector n, uh, but as, as we know, it's really n doesn't, is just as valid as minus n. So we should think of it, if you like, as a kind of double-headed arrow. And we could ask, well, what's the best n we could choose? Well, you could get that by minimizing this expression, the integral of S2 of n tends n minus p tends to p squared times rho. And that thing that you're minimizing there is actually, if you see, think about it a little, it's two into one minus m of x n dot n. Okay, so you want, to, you want to minimize that over n. So obviously the, the answer is that you take the, the eigenvector of m corresponding to its largest uh, eigenvalue. So that's, that's three different kinds of uh, descriptions. So let me start with, with doing something for the first uh, kind of description. So this is the Onsaka model with the so-called Maya-Saupe uh, uh, interaction. So we're going to consider the case when, when rho 
is independent of x, so it's now rho of p. And here's the free energy in the, in the theory. It's, uh, it's theta is the temperature, which, which I think of as being uh, constant. So it's Boltzmann's constant times theta times the integral of this rho log rho, and this entropy term rho log rho over the sphere, minus a half, the double integral of, of a kernel, which depends on p and q, and you easily see that it has to can only depend on the bulk product of p and q times rho of p, rho of q. And um, in, the, in the case of the Myosalpy potential, little k of s is, is capital K s squared. So if you divide by kb theta, uh, you get the, the, the new equivalent functional i of rho, which is the integral of rho log rho as before, and now minus a constant kappa over two. And you see that this expression with, with s squared there becomes m of rho squared because p dot q squared is the dot product of p tensor p with q tensor q. So you see that this second term only depends on rho through its second moment. Okay. And, and, and the second moment, here's the second moment, m of rho corresponding to, to, to rho. Okay, so that's the functional. So, um, so what are its critical points? Well, you write down the Euler-Lagrange equation and, and you find that it's one plus log of rho uh, plus um, kappa times m of rho dot p tensor p plus a constant. So the constant comes because, of course, you've got the constraint that the integral of rho is one. So you get a constant. And so you find that the solutions have to satisfy rho of p is the exponential of m of rho dot p tensor p, and then you divide it by, well, it has to be divided by the integral of that. So that's the kind of partition function there. Now, if you write that in um, the, uh, the eigen, the eigen um, with respect to the eigenvectors of the symmetric matrix M, which I call EI, uh, of course, M has, is positive, so its eigenvalues are positive. It has trace one, so it's, the sum of the eigenvalues is one. Then you see, if, if, I, calcul if I calculate the integral of, um, of uh, rho times pi squared, uh, uh, that's got to give me, um, so, so that's got to give me gamma i times z, where z is the, uh, is the partition function here. So you see that you, uh, you've, got, you've got three unknowns there, uh, gamma one, gamma two, and gamma three, which you've got to, which you've got to solve, um, which, which you've got to solve for. So they're, they're three algebraic equations and they automatically add, up, automatically add up to one. Well, there's some great papers uh, around 2005 of Bakulin and Slastikov and Yu Zhang and Zhang, which characterized all solutions of, 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 of that equation as a function of kappa, uh, thus describing uh, in this theory the isotropic to pneumatic phase transformation. So for a high value of theta, the solution is, 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 uh, is isotropic, so rho is one over four pi, uh, dp if you like. And then, uh, then there's a critical temperature where, where there's a phase transformation to a, a pneumatic phase. And that pneumatic phase is axisymmetric. In other words, two of the gamma i are equal. And, and the hardest part of, the, of, of these papers is to show that in fact, um, you, you, you cannot have solutions with um, the gamma i's all different. So that all solutions uh, have to be axisymmetric. So uh, last year, I spent a couple of months at the Newton Institute trying to find a, a simple proof um, of, of, of this result. And eventually, eventually I found one after about 200, throwing 200 pieces of paper in the waste paper basket, I think. So here's, here's, a, here's what I, I claim is a quick proof that um, the gamma i's uh, can't all be different. So, so if there's an idea in this proof, it's that uh, you shouldn't use spherical polars because as soon as you use spherical polars, you've made a choice of an axis. And since you're, you're wanting to, to, you're talking about symmetry, that sort of desymmetrizes the problem and makes it more difficult. So it's based on integration by parts on the sphere. Uh, so here's the, here's the lemma, so you can see it, and you see that some of the terms look like the ones in the, uh, the Euler-Lagrange equation. So how do you get it? Well, um, you just apply the divergence theorem on, on, on the ball. 
So, uh, so uh, if you have a smooth U, then the divergence of, of the vector du dp3 zero minus du dp1 is of course zero. So since the normal is given by P, uh, uh, you, you, by the divergence theorem, you find that the integral of P1 du dp3 minus P3 du dp1 is zero. And then you have to just choose the right U, which is, which is P1, P3 times this, this exponential and you get and you get, the, you get the result. So let me remind you what the equations were again. So here's the equations. And now you see that um, uh, in the lemma, we, we effectively have this integral with two values of i subtracted. So if I go back to the lemma, you see I got p1 squared minus p3 squared times that exponential. And, you, and on the right-hand side, we have a gamma one minus gamma three, and that's the same, thing that we have um, here when I subtract two of those things. So, so let's suppose that the gammas are all different. And so since gamma one is not equal to gamma three, we can divide by it. And what we end up with is two kappa times this integral of p1 squared, p3 squared times the exponential is z. And so now we could uh, replace three by two and subtract those two equations and the, and the z will disappear. So that's what I've done. And now I've used the gamma one is not equal to gamma two. So now I've got this expression. And in this expression, I can change variables on the sphere. That means I can swap two and three. So swapping two and three, I get this expression. And then I add them and you get that the integral of uh, over the sphere of p1 squared times p3 squared minus p2 squared, the exponential of, of, of kappa gamma 1 p1 squared is common to both of these terms. And then you get this difference of these two exponentials. And then a quick calculation shows that that is positive if and only if kappa gamma 2 minus gamma 3 times p2 squared minus p3 squared is positive. So now we use that gamma 2 is not equal to gamma 3. And so the integrand has to have one sign, but it's supposed to be zero, which is a, a contradiction. Okay, now, the case of, of, of an isotropic um, uh, um, fluid is, is when rho is, is one over four pi. And then if you, if you calculate M, you find that it's one third times the identity matrix. And De Gennes preferred to use the tensor you get by subtracting off this isotropic case from M, and he called that Q. So Q is M minus a third the identity. So it's this integral over S2 of P tensor P minus a third the identity, which, which in alternative notation is the, is the Q tensor corresponding to rho. And now you see that um, Q is again symmetric, of course. Now its trace is zero by construction. And now the condition that M is a positive definite matrix is transferred to the condition that the minimum eigenvalue of Q is bigger than minus a third. And I, I put it in red because I, I'm, I'm going to talk about that. And, uh, and it's, um, and, well, the issue is how that uh, condition is going to be preserved in the theory because it's a, it's a physical condition. Also, you can compute the Euclidean norm of m squared, and it's the same as the Euclidean norm of q squared plus a constant. So you can write i of rho in this equivalent form. So it's just the same to use m or, or q up to adding a, adding a constant. Well, suppose now that we use a description based on q. How should the energy be expressed as a function of q? So uh, what you do is you you can see, you, you look at the entropic term here, the integral of rho log rho, let's call it E of rho. And then given a Q, which is trace free and which satisfies the eigenvalue constraint here, that the minimum eigenvalue is strictly bigger than minus a third, it's easy to show that there's a unique probability distribution rho sub Q that minimizes E subject to the linear constraint that the Q tensor corresponding to rho is q. So why is that? Well, um, 
these conditions on, on, on Q ensure that the sort of the set of admissible functions is non-empty, that you can find something that makes this a continuous distribution uh, row, uh, which, um, which, which, which has Q of row equals Q and makes this integral finite. Then you see the integrals are a strictly convex function of rho and it's super linear growth. So it's a kind of direct, it's a direct uh, application of the direct method of the calculus variations and the, and, the, and the constraint here is linear. So you can pass to the limit in it using weak convergence in an obvious way. So then following uh, Catriel and, and, and co-workers and, and work of myself and Apala Majumda, you define F of Q be the energy corresponding to the minimum value of this, namely E of rho of Q. And then of CB of Q to be F of Q minus kappa over two Q squared. And I've dropped the, I've dropped the constant. Now. So uh, that's the energy uh, expressed as a function now of, of Q, according to this, uh, this prescription. And in fact, you can show that f of q is strictly convex, and it does blow up as the minimum eigenvalue uh, goes to minus the third. In fact, it blows up logarithmically, and you've got these quite tight estimates above and, and below. So we'll call this uh, CB of q um, the, um, the singular bulk potential. Now, in the X-dependent uh, landau degen theory, the, the free energy of a pneumatic is assumed to have the form that you integrate uh, a free energy density depending on Q and the gradient of Q over, over omega. And it's conventional to split up the integrand into two pieces, the, the bulk piece and the elastic piece. So first of all, you put the gradient equal to zero, and that bit is the bulk energy. Of CB of Q, and then, then you have to, of course, subtract it off again, and that bit is the bit that really depends on gradient of Q, and that's the elastic energy. So now, in the literature, it's often assumed that the bulk energy has this quartic form, where you see there are three coefficients, A, B, and C, and A is, is assumed to be linear in the temperature. However, uh, that choice doesn't preserve the eigenvalue constraint, that the minimum eigenvalue is bigger than minus a third. In any case, whether you use the quartic or the singular potential, uh, uh, they both predict an isotropic to uniaxial pneumatic um, phase transformation at a critical temperature. So that above some critical temperature, uh, Q is zero, that corresponds to the isotropic case. And then when you go past the critical temperature, it, it has two equal eigenvalues. And this is the a form of a trace-free matrix, which has two equal eigenvalues. So the S would depend on, on, on kappa. So S n tends to n minus a third, the identity for some unit vector n. Now for the elastic part of the energy, it's usually assumed that that's quadratic in the gradient of Q, and it has to satisfy some isotropic condition. And here's, some here's an example, here are four different examples of isotropic functions that are quadratic in the gradient of Q. Uh, you can see that uh, I2 minus I3 is a null Lagrangian, which can be written as a divergence. So that's an interesting remark that we'll come to a bit later in the, um, in the, in the case of the ozang frank theory. And, the, um, and, the, and, and this fourth one here is the only one which has a Q in it explicitly. And it's in fact one of six possibly, possible linearly independent cubic terms, which are quadratic in the, in the gradient of Q. And we'll assume that the elastic part of the energy is a linear combination of those four uh, isotropic uh, functions with uh, uh, coefficients uh, Li. So these are our material constants. And if L2 and L3 and L4 are zero, then you see that uh, CE would be just L1 over two times I1, and I1 is the gradient of Q squared. So that's the, the so-called, sorry, that's the so-called uh, one constant um, landau degen theory. And we'll, 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 we'll talk about that also in, in terms of the ozang frank theory uh, in a bit. Now, if we use the singular bulk potential, then since uh, the energy blows up as the um, minimum eigenvalue goes to minus a third, and if you have any 
any, any minimize uh, Q star of, of I of Q, um, you know, subject to some boundary condition, say, uh, on, the, on the boundary of omega, um, then its minimum eigenvalue will certainly be bigger than minus a third almost everywhere. Otherwise, the energy would be infinite, of course. So it's an interesting question to ask and a difficult one to answer um, uh, whether, in fact, for a minimizer, the minimum eigenvalue is bounded away from minus a third. So it's, it's, it's bigger than minus a third plus epsilon uh, almost everywhere for some positive epsilon. And there are partial results due to a polymer Jumda and I. That was for the, case, for the one constant case. The one constant case is always much easier. And so we, we did it for that and, 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 and uh, other results by Evans, Newsom, Tran, Tran, and Bauman and Phillips and, and, and Geng and Pop. So, um, uh, but the, in, in, in 3D, in, 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 in the full case, uh, it, it's, it's wide open how to do this. And it's, it's, it's one manifestation of the fact that uh, the general case is always much harder than the, than the one constant case. So, so this, is, um, this is reminiscent of the even harder problem of deciding whether in nonlinear elasticity, minimizes y star of the elasticity functional, the integral of the psi of range y of x, satisfy that the determinant is bounded away from zero almost everywhere when the free energy blows up as the determinant goes to zero. So I, I claim that that is a much harder problem because uh, in, in, in the elasticity problem, the, the constraint is on the highest derivative, whereas in the liquid crystal problem, it's, it's on q and we potentially could use gradient Q to, to try and control things. Okay, now I want to turn to the ozone frank model, which has as its uh, order parameter the director, which now I, I'm going to take to be a vector field, um, uh, which at each x belongs to S2. So I, I'm going to develop the theory sort of as if I hadn't said anything uh, previously about the land hydrogen or probability distributions, and a bit later I'll make the Connection. So, the ozone frank theory has a has has a free energy, uh, the integral of, of a function that depends on n, this unit vector, and its gradient, and it's quadratic in the gradient. So, two w is is given by this expression. So, there are four constants which are called the frank constants. And you see that all the terms are quadratic in the gradient of of n, but there are this one and this one. Have, a, have an n in them. Now, it turns out that the, 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 the first three terms, or if you like, the three coefficients, uh, are important for governing different configurations of the director. One, the first one is splay, the second is twist, and the third is bend. So we'll see something about that uh, in, in a moment. Now, the fourth term is, is a null Lagrangian. Uh, and, um, so it, it so it's called the saddle splay term, and so the fact that it's null Lagrangian means that um, when you integrate it, the value depends only on the values of n on the boundary. So if our boundary conditions give what n is on the boundary, then we can ignore this term because it will just integrate up to a constant. For some boundary conditions, um, which are interesting, this, 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 um, this is an important term, but if n is specified on the boundary, we can forget about it. Now, Erickson uh, showed that w was non-negative for all n, if and only if these uh, inequalities hold. This, this is not a completely trivial calculation because it uses the fact that, that n is a unit vector. And we'll, we'll assume uh, the strict form of these inequalities where every bigger than or equal sign is replaced by a strict inequality sign. And they're necessary and sufficient for W to be uh, um, bigger than or equal to a positive constant times the gradient of N squared, all N. Of course, W is always bounded above by a positive constant times uh, the gradient of N squared because N is a, N is a unit vector. And each term there is, is quadratic. And to, and to get this uh, um, uh, strict form, you just apply the unstrict form to w minus mu, the gradient of n squared. So we have this energy minimization problem. 
to find an N that minimizes I of N subject to suitable boundary conditions. For example, that we specify what N is on the boundary B uh, N bar. And so that means that from the Erickson inequalities that the natural function space is H1 uh, with values in the sphere S2. So here's the, here's the energy function again. And there are important identities that the curl of n squared is n dot curl n squared plus n cross curl n squared. And then if you take the sum of all the expressions you see here, it turns out that that adds up to the gradient of n squared. So that means that if k1 and k2 and k3 are equal and k4 is zero, so that's the one constant approximation for the ozone frank theory, then I of n is in fact k1 over 2 times the integral of the gradient of n squared. And that's the energy functional or harmonic maps uh, from omega uh, to S2. Well, we've already seen that n of x and minus n of x are physically indistinguishable. So even though the molecules may not be exact, have exact head to tail symmetry, statistically they do. So it's better to consider instead of n of x, the line field, capital N, which is given by uh, little n of x, hence uh, little n of x. Now, if you have a, a smooth line field, it may not be orientable, so that it's impossible to assign a direction that turns it into a smooth vector field. And so here's an example. Uh, which is so it's, the, it's a region outside this solid cylinder perpendicular to the screen, and the line fields have to be parallel, so zero component into the screen, and the line field has to be parallel to these lines. And so you immediately see that if you try to orient it, say with the arrows going to the right here, then you'll eventually get a contradiction in this, in this region. Now you can write a W of little n and gradient of little n as a function W tilde of capital N and the gradient of capital N. Okay, so this is easy to check that you can do this. Uh, and in particular, for the one constant case, the gradient of N squared is just uh, a two to the gradient of little N squared. So then you have the corresponding unoriented energy minimization problem to find a capital N, now with values in RP2, that minimizes the integral of W tilde of capital N and the gradient of capital N subject to suitable boundary conditions. And now the natural function space is H1 with values in RP2. Now it turns out that if omega is simply connected and you have an H1 function uh, with values in RP2, then you can lift it to a, a function uh, little n, uh, which is an H1 of omega. This was proved by Bethuel and Chiron in 2007, and we also did it in 2011. And so you have an n with, uh, you can write as little n uh, tensor n, with the same regularity as capital N. So what that means is that the Ozane Frank model and its unoriented version are equivalent if omega is simply connected. But if omega is not simply connected, that's not true. And there's an example uh, which found with uh, Argia Zarnescu, and there's, a, and there's a, a modification of it to 3D with some better boundary conditions in, 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 in a later set of lecture notes, um, where um, the minimizing capital N in the unoriented theory uh, need not be uh, oriental. So there really is a difference between the uh, two theories. Well, how do you get from the Landau-Degen theory to Ozane Frank? Well, um, you use the fact that the, the, the bulk energy is minimized for uniaxial uh, Qs of this form. So for each, 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 each um, value of, 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 of we, we, get a constant, we, we get a constant S such that uh, Q has this form. So that, that suggests that in the limit of small uh, constants, Li and you have to you have to uh, think how to what it means for them to be small and, and Chuck Gartland wrote a, a nice paper which 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 shows how you you correctly non dimension non dimensionalize elastic constants so in that limit 
you expect that minimizers of the bulk plus elastic energy will be nearly uniaxial. And so that motivates the constraint theory in which you minimize I of Q subject to this constraint. And then if you um, shove the constraint into the elastic part of the energy, you obtain exactly the ozone Frank energy and the Frank constants K1, K4 are in one one correspondence with the constants L1 up to L, L4. So it's, it's consistent with the, uh, the Landau de Gênes theory. Now, from now on, I'm going to consider the standard oriented ozone Frank model uh, with um, energy integral of W of n and the gradient of n, and boundary condition that n on the boundary is equal to some given n bar. Suppose we got a minimizer n and you take a, a test function m, so that's going to be a smooth mapping which is zero on the boundary. Then uh, for epsilon sufficiently small, n of x plus epsilon m of x is, is, is going to be non-zero, so we can form this n epsilon of x, which is going to be a unit vector field, and it, it, it on the boundary will equal m bar because m is zero on the boundary. So formally, we can of course calculate the, the Euler-Lagrange equation, uh, d by d epsilon of i of n epsilon, epsilon equals zero is zero. But to actually do that, we have to calculate what the derivative of n epsilon is with respect to epsilon. And you find that it's actually this projection, identity minus n tends to n times m. And so therefore you get this uh, weak form of the Euler-Lagrange equation, uh, which says that, uh, well, first I differentiate with respect to gradient of n and then the gradient of this, of course, and then plus derivative with respect to n dotted with uh, this, ex this expression, P of n, m. So that's requiring that that vanishes for all smooth m, I'll call that the weak form of the Euler-Lagrange equation. And integrating by parts and, and using the arbitrariness of m, you formally obtain this set of Euler-Lagrange equations. So you have here what you might think of as the usual Euler-Lagrange operator, but because of the constraint that n is a unit vector, it's pre-multiplied by the identity minus n tensor n. So that's a system of second order nonlinear PDE to be solved subject to the pointwise constraint that the n is a unit vector. Now, another way of writing it is to introduce a Lagrange multiplier. So that's equivalent uh, that, uh, um, that the Euler-Lagrange operator is, is, is lambda x times n. And if you want to work out what, the, what lambda of x is, you just take the dot product with n, of course. And so lambda of x is the dot product of the left-hand side with, with n. It's, it's the left-hand side acting on n. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, so how can you solve these equations? Well, maybe there are some exact solutions. And uh, the question of what uh, n of x can be solutions of the Euler-Lagrange equation for all uh, Frank constants k1 up to k4, these are so-called universal solutions, were, was addressed in papers by Maris following uh, seminal work by Jerry Erickson. And Marish showed that the universal solutions consist of three families. One is constant vector fields, or those orthogonal to families of concentric spheres or cylinders. The second is pure twists, which in a suitable coordinate system, uh, the, the, the vector points in the x1, x2 direction, but, but twists with respect to the uh, x3 direction. And then, uh, then the third case is planar fields, that's, that's n n of x is n1 of x1, x2, n2 of x1, x2, zero, that form a concentric or coaxial circles. So let's take a famous example of family one, uh, which is the hedgehog. So that's n hat of x is x over norm x. And that represents a, a point defect. It's, it's sort of schematically represented here. Now, of course, uh, it's not even continuous at zero, but away from zero, it's smooth, and you can um, calculate its, its gradient, and then you can calculate the, the square of the gradient. It's two over norm x squared. So formally calculating the energy 
over the ball, unit ball, remember that W is always bounded above by a constant times the gradient of n squared. So it's bounded above by this integral. We, we, int we get the four pi from integrating with respect to the angle. Then we have an R squared from the change of variables. And now we have two over R squared. So you see that's finite. Uh, so that n hat uh, has finite energy. And so n hat is in, in, in the space H1 with values in S2. Well, here's an interesting uh, result then, uh, which says that um, n hat, the hedgehog, is the unique minimizer of I subject to its boundary conditions if K1 is less than or equal to K2. So this has a, a history. It was proved in different degrees of generality by these various people. Um, and I, I'm going to show you a, a, a quick proof that I found with Epiphania Virga that n hat is a minimizer. We also have a quick proof that it's the unique minimizer, but I'll just show that in fact it is a minimizer. And, and, and the proof is a, is a streamlined version of Fang Wa Lin's proof uh, for the case uh, for the one constant. So the claim is that, that if K1 is less than equal to K2, then this inequality holds. Well, that's just an example of the Ericsson inequalities uh, where you put K4 is equal to 2K1 minus K2. I mean, in the Ericsson inequalities, you have in, in place of 2K1, you have K4 plus K2. And you find that uh, under this condition, K1 less than equal to K2, the Ericsson inequalities hold. So we have this inequality. And now uh, I, I, I can ignore the saddle splay term because I've got fixed boundary conditions. So I just consider the first three terms of the energy I use this inequality. You see that it's I of n is bigger equal now to uh, moves kind of slowly. Um, so k1 times the integral of divergence n squared minus trace squared n squared, but you recognize that as the null Lagrangian. So that has got to equal its value at the boundary, and then you check that in fact that's just I of n hat. Since by direct computation, the divergence of n hat squared is twice trace of gradient n hat squared and the curl of n hat is zero. So that's, that's the proof that it's a, it's a minimizer. And for the uniqueness, you do some kind of Grunwald uh, inequality uh, sort of starting from the outside of the uh, domain. And there's an interesting open question as to whether this is the optimal condition or not. Uh, so we, we've thought about that a lot, but we've failed to so far. Uh, and to a conclusion one way or the other. You can do the same with pure twist solutions. So uh, here's a, that's another universal solution. So here we've got a slab. We've got periodic boundary conditions on the lateral faces. And on the top, n is, uh, is equal to n d. And on the bottom, n zero, the thickness is, is d. And n zero and n d are in the plane, in the x1, x2 plane. And so if you assume that they're not parallel and that K2 is less than equal to the minimum of K1 and K3, then you find there's a unique minimizer. And indeed, it is the, uh, the, the twist uh, that matches uh, the boundary data. So now, remember that I said that K1 governed splay and K2 governed twist and K3 governed bend. So this result is very natural because the hypothesis says that it's easier to twist than it is to splay or to bend. And the answer is that it twists. But what's interesting about the result for the uh, hedgehog is that we make the hypothesis that it's easier to splay than to twist, but we don't need to make the hypothesis that it's easier to splay than to bend. We, did, we didn't need to assume that K1 was less than equal to uh, K3. Well, in general, uh, if you have some boundary data which is already in H1, then it's a routine use of the uh, direct method to show that there's a minimizer of the, of the energy satisfying the boundary data and that it satisfies the weak form of the Euler-Lagrange equation. Now, as we've seen, minimizers can have point defects uh, but not, not line or surface defects. So we, so we can't expect uh, regularity of minimizers. 
Oh, we can, uh, we can hope for partial regularity. Now, the issue of line and surface defects is a, is a, is a big issue, which is, of course, discussed a huge amount. You, you have to, well, it's one of the advantages of the lander Dijon theory that you can, you can treat line defects, uh, for example. So you, so you have to do something. You have to change W and or change the function space. That's a, that's a, a long story, which I, which, I, which I won't go into. In any case, the best known such result the general Frank Constance is, is that proved a long time ago now uh, by Hartlin and Kinderlehrer that any minimizer of, uh, of, 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 um, of, the, of the energy is analytic outside a closed set S whose Hausdorff dimension is less than one. So it can't be a, a line, for example, but it's not known whether it consists of finitely many points or maybe countably many points or something uh, are much more complicated. Now, for the rest of the talk, just a few more slides, um, I want to talk about the one constant case. So that's when uh, the energy is a multiple of the gradient of n squared. And then something well known but interesting happens. The Euler-Lagrange equation takes a much simpler form. Uh, that for harmonic maps is uh, Laplacian n plus the gradient of n squared times n is zero. So the the thing is that the Lagrange multiplier, which in general depends on second derivatives of n, in this case is an explicit function, namely minus squared n squared, of first derivatives of n. And another special feature of the one constant case is that if you take a minimizer or equilibrium solution n and you pre multiply it by an orthogonal matrix, then it remains a minimizer or an equilibrium solution. This is not true in general, but it is true in the one constant case. So for example, you can take the hedgehog and you can rotate it. That, that really change, changes what it looks like. Uh, and, uh, and, and that minimizes I subject to its own boundary conditions. Now in, in the one constant case, there's a, a more precise partial regularity result due to Shane and Uhlenbeck and Brazy's Coron and Leap which says that the, the minimizer n star is smooth, except for a finite number of point defects located at points x, i in omega. And that, and that as you approach uh, each point x, i, the minimizer is, is, uh, is, uh, approaches uh, plus or minus a rotation times a hedgehog located at x, i. So you see that this is actually a solution of the equilibrium equations because it's an orthogonal matrix times a hedgehog. So it's saying that n star approaches that particular solution of the Euler-Lagrange equations as you approach xi. So uh, to end with uh, the case of planar solutions. So planar solutions are ones uh, for which um, n of x is n1 of x1, x2, n2 of x1, x2, and the third component is zero. And you can treat these using complex analysis. So you, so you write z is x1 plus x2, of course. And, and now I complexify n. So I write n, n tilde is n1 plus i n2. And, and n, n is a unit vector. So that has to be uh, uh, have unit modulus. So it's e to the i phi of x. Uh, so, so locally, um, you, you, can, you can work out what the uh, Euler-Lagrange equation is, and you find that it's i e to the i phi times the Laplacian of phi is zero. So it's a locally equivalent to the linear Laplace equation. So that means in particular that equilibrium solutions of locally finite energy are smooth by regularity. So there are no, there are no defects in this two-dimensional uh, one constant case. And then there's another cute thing that happens. Suppose you take two equilibrium solutions, n tilde, with complex versions of them, n tilde and m tilde. And then you multiply them together as a product of complex numbers. Or you take n tilde and you, div you, you take one over it as a complex number. Then that stays an equilibrium solution. So you see, obviously, if I from the fact that the phases satisfy the Laplacian of phi is zero, then if I, if, if, if I multiply uh, um, e to the i phi by e to the i of psi, then of course I, I just, I find that the Laplacian of phi plus of psi is zero. 
So then this is this, this is obvious, but interesting, uh, and, and and so you could, you can you can construct interesting equilibrium solutions that way. And so I, I'll just show how you can use this to treat an exterior problem. So this is of course very strong hypotheses where where in, in, in two dimensions we've got a finite number of bounded uh, domains little omega one up to little omega m. And on each, on the boundary of each of them, I'm going to specify what the director is. So on, on the boundary of this one, it's going to be n1 as a function of, which can vary as you go around. And on the second one, it's going to be n2. On the third one, and finally on the mth one, it's going to be nm. And I'm, I'm going to be interested in the exterior. I'm going to regard these, these uh, as fixed particles that don't move. And uh, I'm going to be working in the exterior omega of these particles. And I, I, I choose an R zero, which is sufficiently large to in such that the ball center zero radius R zero includes all these, all these particles. And uh, well, each one has a degree, each one of these uh, vector fields on the boundary has a degree. Let's K, let K be the sum of the degree. And the question is what, what we can say about equilibrium configurations in this set X, which is now S1 val valued functions of on, on omega, which are locally in, in H1. So the integral over omega intersection BR of grad N squared is finite for all R big and R zero. And on the boundary, uh, we have the uh, required, the given data uh, NI. And what happens uh, at infinity? That's uh, the question. And uh, you see, we'll, we'll have different homotopy classes of vector fields satisfying these things, depending on how many times you go around each obstacle and so on. So here's the result. Uh, you consider this renormalized energy. You have to subtract something off. So K, K remembers the, the, the total degree. So you have to subtract something off to get energy that's finite because you're in 2D. And uh, so this is a result I proved with my, my last Oxford research student, Lu Liu, that in each homotopic class of X, there's a unique minimizer of this renormalized energy, that it's a smooth harmonic map, and that at infinity, it, it tends to this, this fixed um, uh, N, which is cos of K theta plus a constant, which depends on, 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 the, on the homotopy class, uh, sine k of theta plus beta c, and uh, beta c is a real number. Now in each homotopy class, there's also a harmonic map which makes E infinite. So you see that this is selecting a good, a good uh, minimizer. And furthermore, uh, E attains a minimum in, in, in the whole of X, but N star is not in general unique. Now you can, you can Consider the case of non-orientable line fields by the trick that if you if you take a non-orientable line field and you square it as a complex number, it becomes orientable. But I, I haven't stated it exactly. So let me just end by showing you a very interesting little trick, uh, which which enables you to prove this relatively easily. So the main idea is this trick of Carbu. So you pick points a i in little omega i. And then you, uh, you let di be the degree of ni. And then you can write any equilibrium solution as a hedgehog based at a1 to the power d1. These are all complex numbers multiplied together. And finally, a z minus am over the hedgehog based at am to the power dm times e to the i phi of z. But now, phi is a smooth solution of the Plasius equation in the whole of omega. So, so somehow putting these expressions here unwinds all the all the uh, degrees of the different um, vector fields, and so you end up. So you don't have to worry about you know, that, that phi is only defined up to two pi. It's 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 done that for you, and it reduces you to the Plasius equation in the whole of omega. And a rough proof is that if you take if you um, uh, divide by uh, these expressions. Because each of them is a solution, so uh, when you multiply them together, they're solutions. You raise them to a power, they're solutions. When you divide by it, it's a solution. And you, and you check that this, that this expression is an equilibrium solution. Well, we, we, we've already shown that that's the case, and that it has degree zero. And the fact that it has degree zero gives you that, um, that you can solve the Plasius equation 
in the whole of Omega. Well, that's all I, all I have to say. I hope you uh, enjoyed something uh, from, from, from this uh, uh, quick uh, survey of, of liquid crystals. Well, thank you, John, for a wonderful and clear talk. We're gonna have the possibility for a few questions and they'll proceed as follows. If you want to ask a question, you need to raise your hand. And you do that in, by uh, bringing up the participants menu. And right below the menu, there should be a button to raise hand. So, and if your hand is raised, I'll try to unmute you or you can try to unmute yourself and maybe put on your video. So the floor is open for questions. Everybody's trying to figure out how to raise their hand. So I see Sean Walker has his hand raised. Yeah. Go ahead and turn on your video if you can. Uh. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I want to see the mute option on the video. But anyway, I just had a question about the <clears throat> Landau de Gen inequalities. Uh, you know, the ones that need to be satisfied to give a coercive uh, energy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was just curious if you have a, a good reference for that, because the one in Gartland references I do. There's a paper of Zarnescu and some people. I'll send you the reference, Sean. Uh, that, that's. Uh, but I mean, it, it is in. It is in the paper of Longer. Yeah, but, but it uses this. There's a quick. There's, there's a quicker proof in the in in, in a paper of Argier and some other people. Oh, um, uh, okay. Okay, so that would be good. That's all. Okay, Fang Lin has his hand raised. Oh, okay. Hi, John. Nice Hi, Fang Wal. Hey. Um, so I have one uh, first question. Yes, this uh, interesting fact you observe this uh, take average on ball is in yeah. HM plus one over two. Now I see uh, one can use Fourier transform to prove that, but I don't know <laughs> well, well, how do you do it in general? Uh, well, Okay, so so it's a, a, indeed there's 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 ex exactly so you you take Fourier transforms and um uh, and there are known estimates for the characteristic for the Fourier transform of the characteristic right. of function of a ball. And what's interesting is that um, it depends on the um, the fact that the ball is has a curved boundary. So, for example, if you if you take the average over a, a, over a cube. Then it's then it's that has h one regularity, but no more. Right, right, right. Yes, and that, and that of course is because of different estimates for the Fourier transform. And of course, this, this is an absolutely standard technique for for these people that are in harmonic analysis, and they're and, and they're doing averages over spheres and stuff. But I, I just haven't seen it stated like this. That's all. So I'm oh, not okay. Surprising. Okay. Now the second question is uh, uh, related to x of the marge x. Uh, yeah. So when K2 is larger than K1, yeah. uh, it's uh, certainly an uh, absorptive minimizer. Uh, so when K1 is, is uh, larger than K2, but close, uh, one can also show that. Mm -hmm. uh, but when K1 is really much larger than K2, uh, I think it's not true. Uh, in fact, uh, Numerical, well, numerical computation show it's not true, but also yeah. uh, when like a K2 fix, a K1 go to infinity, one know the uh, limiting configuration uh, is actually uh, very different. So one probably can do something there to show. So, but in intermediate range, it's a very tricky question, still open, I guess. So, so yes, and so there's the, there's the there's some kind of second variation. Of course, you're taking the second variation about something that's singular, but there's a second variation of calculation. So it's a question of whether that condition is, is, is necessary and sufficient or not. Now, I'm not sure about the numerical because the numerical, uh, well, some numerical results actually conflict with the result for K1 less than equal to K2. Yeah, so uh, in early 1990s, I asked one of my students did a calculation. 
So take K2 equals one and K1 actually equals two. And the monotonicity of energy, the fact simply fail. Now this is a very reliable computation. And therefore, uh, this X of a margin X cannot be minimized mm -hmm. in this case already. You, you see what I mean, right? You look at the energy on board B1, you calculate, and you calculate energy mm -hmm. uh, yeah. on B1 half and multiply by two, and you yeah. already see uh, on half ball multiply by two, the energy is larger than the energy mm -hmm. on board B1. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. I just want to uh, say that. Thank you, Zoe. I'll ask uh, Raghav Venkat Raman to unmute and ask a question. Uh, so this is a uh, question that's related to uh, the previous question about the hedgehog. So is it known uh, whether the hedgehog uh, retains stability uh, past uh, a little bit beyond um, sort of K, uh, K1 bigger than K2? Well, well, well that's guess, variation or, calculation, but it's a question of what you mean by stability, of course. In the second sense of second variations. Well, yes, but it, it is a second variation right. around a singular thing. Right, 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 right. right. And um, and are there sort of conjectures for what um, the minimizer, at least even numerically, uh, are there sort of um, spiral well, type of things, which I mean people believe could be potential sort of minimizers? And well, Epiphania Virgo and I, we did some calculations, which was a kind of rotated uh, hedgehog. So we sort of tried right. to, so that was the, that was the kind of idea, but we, we haven't proved anything definitive. Okay. And Stu Antman? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Uh, what are worthy generalizations of these problems? Suppose, can you introduce electromagnetic effects, for example? Well, I, I, I'm ashamed to, to, okay, see, electromagnetic effects is, is very interesting. There's actually there's a, a recent paper, again, by Chuck Gartland, and we're, we're starting to have a conversation about it, but it's, it's the, it, it's, it's, it's difficult, at least for me, to um, to reconcile what sort of energy minimization with. I mean, I mean, some of the terms have the have the wrong sign, so the energy is 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 apparently unbounded below. So you're supposed to take some kind of minimax instead of minimizing things, and so I'm I'm a bit confused about why. Um, why, why, I mean, is there a, is, if you include electromagnetic fields or under some kind of approximation, is there some kind of underlying Lyapunov function for the, for the dynamics? So I, I, I I'm, but well, that's my own ignorance about how, how to, how to understand what uh, uh, stability means uh, and, and why some kind of minimization um, uh, is, is, is possible for those problems. Uh, it's discussed in the paper Hart, Kindlella, and myself. Uh -huh. uh, magnetic field is low order. The electric field, indeed, as John said, one term is negative, but uh, however, it had to satisfy a constraint condition. That means you minimize on sort of like a certain sub-manifold, constraint sub-manifold. And we are the minimizing process is well defined. You see, it had to satisfy the Maxwell equation. Yes. Yeah, but and it this becomes a constraint. dynamic as well, of course. Yeah, then it becomes constraint. And under this constraint, you, you have a well-defined minimization. Yeah, well, that's, you sl that, that's slaving things to the, uh, uh, electrum, to, the, to, the, to the field. But of course, I mean, usually we take, when we're doing energy minimization, we, we, we have some dynamic equations that correspond to the whole thing. And, and we motivate energy minimization by, by having some kind of Lyapunov function for the whole thing. So that's, that's the thing that confuses me uh, when you have the fields. I, I don't know, I don't know, I mean, I mean, the electromagnetic field is also dynamic, of course. So. Okay, so that brings us to the end. I want to thank John for a wonderful talk. And thanks to the organizers and the journal and the activity group and to Siam for this initiative. It's going to continue next month on July 2nd with Benoit Pertain talking about multi-phase models of living tissues. And I just wish everybody a good morning, afternoon, evening, whatever. Stay safe and thank you. Thank you.